If you don't mind a very brief follow-up. Um, I think that gentleman short has been waiting. Yeah, thank you. We're running happy to a talk little to bit short of time. Yeah. There's a bit of time maybe after. If you want to come and talk so to me much. then, yeah. I'll be yes. happy to. Uh, hello. Oh, um, the, the session deserves a few more sorry, questions. Sorry yeah. if I Go ahead. Yep. Sorry if I took too long, but the question is kind of long. So um, please bear with me. There's two minutes. So I am Cosme. Um, I'm an UWC student. And as a scholar, I had to go through an incredible, um, unthinkable odyssey in order to get where I am standing now. While I enjoy uh, this educational system because I am able to, one of the uh, people I know in my country got rejected by the same, uh, uh, you know, the scholarship system that accepted me. So it was not only one, it was actually 99.3% of the applicants who got rejected. Um, and I am one of the 20 lucky students who were able to travel so far out of Spain um, to one of the most inspiring movements in education in the world. Uh, of course, they will get more opportunities in their lives, but this makes me think of the incredibly overpriced tuition fees that sink students in debt for their lives, or the student that cannot apply to the university he would dream of going because their high school course is not among the requirements of applications. This leaves us in, in a hard cycle, which is extremely hard to break, and it's consistent, of a, syst consistent of, uh, of a system in which reputation is only awarded to those who belong to the top part of the pyramid, um, which is uh, the society. And after that, uh, we'll end up with uh, educated perhaps 10% of the country, which will overwhelm the other 90% with the expertise, uh, depth of knowledge, in, in known cases, leaving their opinions to shame. Uh, but in spite of that, it's not the 10% of the population that will decide the root of a country, but the majority, of the n the, the majority is the 90%. Uh, but this 90% will be obviously uh, highly influenced by the 10%, which is the top of the pyramid. So how can a society advance, for, uh, be advanced, for example, uh, in, in respect, if the 90% of the society do not receive higher education that teaches them respect? Uh, so consequently, you will basically have an education, uh, in, like a country that doesn't appreciate respect. And this doesn't only happen to respect, with respect, but also with many other things. Uh, the foundation of sciences, in, in order to understand devices used daily, or the economic theory that the rules the macro world will live in, uh, we're basically so, uh, telling... Sorry, sorry can you uh, yeah, ask a question? I, I am finishing now. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, we're basically telling them to uh, guide their boat following the polar star instead of telling them how to interpret the skies. So how can we basically carry this last thing? How can we teach them to interpret the skies so they can navigate properly in their freedom uh, if we live in an everyday, more merit-based society? Okay. Good question, yeah. Thanks. Well, it's a, a good question, it's right. I mean, the issue, though, is for you about how you use the privilege that you've just been given. You're right. You're part of a, a small minority with the privilege of this kind of education. And uh, the President spoke earlier on about leadership. How are you going to use your leadership in the future? You're being given something of great worth. It's a pearl of precious price. And how are you going to use it? The world is only going to be as good as the people who populate it. So put something back in. Yes, make your career, make your prosperity for you and your family and all those things, but don't forget the world around you. Use the opportunities that you have, especially in a country like Spain, where that's where you decide to, to live when you finish your education. It's a democracy, it's a place where you can play your part in the civic and political life of the nation. Play it in some way. It doesn't mean necessarily going into party politics, but it does mean putting something back in some way to make it a more just society so that people who haven't had the opportunity that you have had will have the opportunity to do so in the future. It's a patient business and it's a small stone strategy. But I often say to people, what has to happen for a landslide to begin? You think about it, a small stone has to move. So be the small stone that makes the landslide happen. Be help to create a more just society by using the gifts that you've been given. Nothing wrong with privilege, so long as you use the privilege that you've been given for the advantage of others. I would uh, add to that, that privilege is a right. Now you have a big responsibility. <laughs> Thank you. I respect what he's just said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, good evening, panelists. Uh, I'm Ross Song. I'm from the St. Joseph Institution Senior School. And I have just one short question for Lord Elton. Um, you mentioned earlier about servant leadership. And with respect to that and the three R's, could you give us a few examples of how it is practiced and when do we see it in real life? Because I'm sure that um, some of the schools, uh, secondary schools in Singapore, we have heard of the term before, but we don't really know how to put it in practice, or we don't really know what the term is. Thank you. First of all, I think it's about uh, your terms of reference, your frame of mind. But do you want to go, for instance, if you want to go into political pub public life of any kind, are you going to go in in order to dominate and to be a master, as it were, to tell people what they should think and what they should do, or are you going to try and serve them, the people that you have been elected to represent, to champion the poor, the underdogs, the voiceless, the powerless, you know, what are your priorities going to be? So you have to work out how you serve people. There's a big difference between simply being someone who imposes his will on everybody and someone who is willing to serve people, but to stand firm for the things you believe as well. I'm not saying, you know, accept everything that comes along at face value. You've got to have your own principles. You don't say, these are my principles and now I'll look at an opinion poll and now I'll change them. No, you don't say that. You say, these are my principles, I stand for them, but one of my principles is to serve you. Um, when I was, was a, a student, I decided to get involved in politics. And it wasn't about because I wanted a political career. That was the last thing I would have done if I'd, I'd joined a, a tiny party with half a dozen members of, of the House of Commons. But I joined it living in a neighborhood where half the houses had no inside sanitation, running hot water or bathrooms. And I felt that these people had been neglected for generations. And I wanted to do something about it. So just sitting around talking about it wasn't going to do anything. So I began campaigning about it in that neighborhood. And I was able to get that sort of injustice put right. I eventually became the housing chairman. I was able to get inside sanitation provided for those homes. And I was, in a sense, rewarded in inverted commas because people in a parliamentary by-election uh, were crazy enough to send me to the House of Commons to represent them. But I think that happened as a result not of... You know, it certainly wasn't because my party was about to form a government or anything. It, it, it wasn't. It was running at 7% in opinion polls. Uh, but it was about serving a community and therefore being given something back by them in due course as, as it happened. So I, that's the best I can probably do in explaining what I, I think it means in the way you work it out. There are lots of other things among you. You'd be a school governor if you care about education but you're not going to teach. Get involved in the local school and help them with their fundraising. You can join a hospice because you, you think, well... I, I want the term ill to have proper palliative care and a respectful dignity in dying at the end of their lives. Support the hospice. You can be a justice of the peace. You can visit prisons. If you're educated, go in and teach prisoners who are perhaps illiterate so that they have a chance of restorative justice to change their lives so that they don't just re-offend when they come out again. You know, discover what it is that you've got to do. We are all different. We all have different roles. But there is something that's marked out for each of us uh, that we have a duty to do. Uh, and I guess for you, the issue is to find what it is. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. So, uh, good evening, sis. I think my question is directed mainly to President Arno and also Lord Elton. Uh, it's mainly about Finland's education revolution. I think as educators, y'all will have he heard about it. They are no longer going to teach subjects and the syllabus in vacuo. So, they are trying to, say, take a thematic approach. Say, maybe they talk about the EU and they talk about the history, the politics uh, regarding it. But currently, they're facing a lot of uh, resistance from the local teachers because it's a bit challenging in terms of logistics uh, to actually do it. So, that they have to resort to giving them bonuses. But I've so my question is, um, <coughs> so um, how can institutes actually expect teachers to impart or provoke ethical learning without taking a normative position? Because what I'm thinking is that if they take a normative view, um, if taken to an extreme, it will be seem to be politizing. But if they take a positive view, then what change is it from the from the status quo where actually subjects are still taught in vacuo? So. Um, are we going to need, say, a really big revolution where we throw back to, say, the age of Socrates, where we learn through dialogue and, and, and mentorship instead? Okay, thank you. Did you noted that question. Yep. That lady, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Hannah Bedford from UWC East. Um, my question would be, is all of these things, whilst have great merit, uses words such as duty and responsibility to society, and these terms have been used in the past and currently as means of mo mobilizing societies and groups of people towards detrimental causes, i.e. Boko Haram or um, the Nazis, because that was their responsibility to help the society to make them great again. So how would you 
use the, put into place such systems without allowing them to be manipulated by, by people for specific causes. Thank you. Yes, the penultimate question, yeah? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, businesses are fundamental to societies and they employ a large number of your young people today. How do you move businesses away from the business of business is business as advocated by Milton Friedman to respect responsibility and rights being exercised in a way that goes back to society and creates environments that we want to sustain. Thank you. Thank you. And the ultimate question. Yep. No, I can wait. It's a little more long, but... Can, uh, you, can you do it in quick, one minute? Okay, yep. so uh, first of all, I really appreciate that uh, in the start of the discussion, uh, the, the panelists uh, present the topic of the worry about the mercantilization in the education. And that is uh, one of the main topics that produce a big struggle in my home country, Chile. In the last decade in Chile, you can find a big, a strong a student social movement that reproduces the critics uh, towards a one educational system that is, first of all, uh, based in the ideals of uh, if you have more money, you can access a, a really good education, but if you have less money, you haven't the chance to uh, participate in, in processes of the educational opportunities. And the other problem, the main problem that this social movement uh, finds was how we can provide to the entire population this opportunity about uh, receiving an education, not only for studying the university or study to finish the high school. It's about an education to conceive citizens that can reproduce a political participation in the country. So as a student that participated in that movement, that it, the peak was in 2011, my question is how extended uh, in the proposal that you put here in the conceptual idea of education for citizens, how, uh, what extent can be the practical approach in the governmental policies and the interaction that can provide a universal education in the country and for the population? And I think I'll begin with Prof. Uh, Dimea, and then move on to Prof. Tang, and then end with Lord Elton, no? Justin? Really? Way? Okay, Lord Elton, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you can see where they made him president, can't you? <laughs> uh, I'm very happy for you to pass that responsibility to me. Um, let me take questions one and three together, really, because they both revolved around the same point about the, the role of business. and how we behave ethically within business. Some years I, I chaired an ethical investment fund in London and a very esteemed uh, banking house, Rathbones, who were not caught up in the subsequent banking scandal, were, were the advisors to that ethical investment fund. And every month we would come together on behalf of the, those who had invested in the fund and who wanted the security of mind to know that their money was not being used in the sale of arms or being used in unethical practices by the pharmaceutical industry or being used to promote pornography or whatever it was. I mean, there were a whole series of criteria that we, we had. And we would go through our investments and then we would write sometimes to the companies who maybe unwittingly, and these included major retailers, had somehow got caught up in some, uh, promoting these things. And I was very pleased to often see the responses that we got because people sitting in boardrooms also wanted to go home at night feeling good about the companies that they run and about how they themselves behave. So the idea that everybody's a charlatan and just out to trample on everybody is not true. But you're right, how do you create that idea in people's minds? Well, it starts here in places like your business school where you, you it, and you asked about whether things are normative or how you go about this, but you, it, it isn't for the, for the tutor, for the lecturer to say to you, this is the conclusion. It's for him to lay down the alternatives for you and for you to work that out and to say, was that an ethical thing to do or not? So I do think there's an ethical dimension in everything we do, in every world that we, we live in, whether it's in commerce, business, politics or whatever. Um, and you have to look then at practice, things like the bonuses, for instance, the way in which some of the banks behaved uh, that led to the financial crisis that has engulfed us now with so much tragedy for so many people who have been caught up in it over the last decade. That greed, that sort of 
desire for more and more, for bigger, faster, better and more, to trample on whoever you like without any regard for the consequences, I think is a, is a scandal. And it's right to therefore challenge that kind of ethic. And it therefore begins before you enter management or the boardroom. Um, and I think universities do have a role in that. The question was asked about how you avoid manipulation. And you asked particularly, for instance, about the example of the Nazis. It's pretty difficult to avoid these things. There was a, a group of students, of course, it, uh, Sophie Scholl and the, the Red Rose group, tiny number of students who in their universities spoke out against Nazism. They were all executed as a result by the Nazis. So for some people, there will be an ultimate price to pay. It was Pastor Martin Niermoller, who at the end of the Second World War was asked by the American Congress, how did these things come about? How did it happen? And Niermoller said, first they came for the communists, and because I wasn't a communist, I did nothing. Then they came for the trades unionists. Because I was, wasn't a trade unionist, I did nothing. Then they came for the Jews, and because I wasn't a Jew, I did nothing. Then they came for the Catholics, and because I was a Protestant, I did nothing. And then they came for me, and by that time, there was no one left to speak for me. And that is the reality for each of us. But if we do nothing, then of course these things come to pass. So yes, we can be manipulated. I told you I traveled in North Korea. There was a report a few months ago by the United Nations that said it's a state without parallel. 200,000 people in its, incarcerated in its prison camps. I wrote a book last year about North Korea where I set out some of the human rights situation in that tragic country. It is very difficult for people inside North Korea to do anything about it without facing execution, as Chang Song Tek did last year uh, on the command of Kim Jong-un. It's not difficult for us to do something about it. And we live in a, a small world now, in comparison even with the world in which I grew up in. We've been globalized. In some ways, there are negative things, but in many ways, there are some wonderful positive things. One is that we can do more for our brothers and sisters, wherever they may be. So we have a duty to get involved. And that brings me really to the last of the questions of, and about Chile. Um, we have a duty to understand situations wherever they may be. Neville Chamberlain in 1939, who was the British Prime Minister, having surveyed what had happened in Czechoslovakia, said, this is a faraway country about which we know very little, we the British. The appeasement that he represented with the opposition only of Churchill and a few others was the reason why nothing was done early enough to prevent the engulfing of the whole of Europe in, in the Nazi web. Um, we do have a duty to be involved in social movements of the kind that you described. And universities can play their part in this. At my university in Liverpool, I said to our Vice-Chancellor, we need to be town and gown. We are not an army of occupation in our city. We need to provide a forum, a place, a neutral place, as the President has described, to stimulate debate, to get people talking honestly with one another, to hear divergent points of views. And I began a public lecture series, the last of which was just two weeks ago. They're downloadable from our website, the Roscoe Foundation website at my university. Um, we had a thousand people sitting in St. George's Hall in Liverpool to hear uh, Professor Peter Hennessy talking about Prime Ministers, watching Prime Ministers. At the previous lecture, we had Helena Kennedy, one of the leading QCs in Britain, one of the human, leading human rights lawyers, and a master of one of the Oxford colleges, talking about what human rights law means in our day and age. We've had the Dalai Lama. We got a complaint immediately, of course, from the Chinese ambassador in London who told me there'll be no more Chinese students for your university. Uh, we were told that the twinning arrangement between Shanghai and Liverpool would be immediately severed. And our Vice-Chancellor said, David, what are we going to do about this? And I said, well, Vice-Chancellor, when the gunboat arrives in the river, then worry about it. And it was interesting for me. The, he came, 3,000 people came to hear him. And that day, I opened a film festival in the city of Tibetan films. And two Chinese students I met going into the film festival, I said, hi, why, why are you coming? And they said, we want to learn about the Dalai Lama. We couldn't do this in our own country, but we want to learn about him here. And, it was, and I had a couple of spare tickets. I was able to get them in to do that. I got a call from the Chinese embassy a couple of days later. Would I come and meet the ambassador? I did. As a result, I was able to travel to Tibet and write a report about the situation in Tibet. So it's worth speaking out. You don't have to do it in an aggressive way that is constantly about confrontation, but opens doors. I don't equivocate on the issue of human rights in North Korea, but it hasn't prevented me from going on four occasions and writing reports on each occasion. So we mustn't be quiet about situations, but we must learn 
through our judgment, I get it wrong sometimes, you know, the man who never made a mistake never made anything, so you're going to make mistakes, uh, I assure you, I can count plenty of mistakes, but you have to at least try, and you have to engage, and generally as you progress, you begin to realise what works and what doesn't, what makes in progress, what doesn't, but institutions, universities particularly, can play a major part in bringing about dialogue and mutual respect and the hearing of alternative points of view, and I believe that brings political progress in its wake. Thank you. Okay. Um, James, do you want to say any final words? No, I know. <laughs> well, that's the reason why I let uh, Lord Alton speak first, because he gave all the answers. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you to the panel. I'm sorry, so I'll ask Professor Arnold de Meyer, President of our University, to present this token to Lord David Elton. Thank you so much. It's a painting by one of our students. Thank you so much, everyone. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for coming. And now let's enjoy ourselves over food and drinks. Thank you. <laughs>